who all here came to see Vlad? Anybody know who B Vlad is? Uh, Vlad is actually on my team, but he's up in the top left picture here in Florida. So he was uh, hit in Tampa, but luckily family is safe, house is okay, but he couldn't make it here to the conference. So I am here for you instead of Vlad. Uh, so Vlad's actually an author. He's written this fantastic book on Go. Uh, he's actively on Twitter, and he's a part of the, the Code team. Uh, Code is an open source initiative at Dell focused on contributing and building ecosystems and community all wrapped around emerging technologies. So my team is really a group of open source engineers and developer advocates uh, that focuses on all kinds of cool technology. Uh, I'm a Go advocate. Uh, I'm a Go developer. Uh, I've written plenty of stuff. I'll, I'll tell you that Vlad is the deep dive guy, but I'll do my best for you guys. So if you have questions, I may defer, uh, but let's see how this goes. So we got three objectives today for the presentation. Uh, first of all, let's talk about why gRPC. I've actually got a ton of experience in developing you know, REST and you know, HTTP-based uh, HTTP -based interfaces. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about you know, where we've been and why we're here at gRPC. Um, we'll go through an example of a gRP service, uh, and then we'll look at some of the extra features that you get by way of uh, gRPC natively. So why gRPC? Like, what, are we, what are we really trying to do? And we're trying to connect two components together. And we want to do this in as simple a way as possible. Uh, if you look at the, the orange uh, depiction from component one to component two, we just want that to be a straight line. We want it to be invisible, right? That should be as easy as it gets. Because connecting two components together isn't where the value is, like the, the, the workings in between them. The value is just having those two things talk to each other. So there's this crooked path that we can walk to get two components to talk to each other. Uh, and that involves having discussions about REST, like building a full REST model around having two things work together, very difficult. Uh, it involves existing you know, RPC methodologies that may be native to languages. Uh, maybe it's HVJSON to make a simple interface. There's lots of discussions that happen around just how you connect two things together. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about what we're going to talk about today, which is simplifying this and standardizing it as you look at uh, building out this communication between components. So what's the situation today? Um, you know, it's really interesting because technology is changing. The demand for uh, interoperability uh, is increasing day by day. You know, the user experience, when I look at something like this, like a, my phone, right? Most of us use our phone almost eight, all day long. And that user experience and responsiveness is really important to us. But we travel through all kinds of different coverage zones, through cell sites and stuff like that. Uh, and getting the bandwidth, getting the responsiveness is just critical to user experience. So we want to be as efficient as we can be uh, when we talk about interoperating. And it may be a service to a service. It may be a phone to a service. Right? We want all that communication to be super efficient. Uh, so you know, mobile technology is driving some changes here. The other thing that's happening is software architectures are changing as well. So we look at like a monolith application. It was pretty simple to have different pieces of the application communicate because you're using you know, in-memory processes that, that just can naturally call functions and stuff like that. Uh, but we look at taking these big monoliths and splitting them out to some type of logical you know, um, microservices, then you have to think about how these things are going to communicate with each other. Uh, are you going to develop your own JSON API, or are you going to use something simple to connect the two components together at that point? So you know, the, the mobile technology, the changing you know, software architectures in, ter in terms of using microservices, these are both driving uh, the need for something like gRPC. So what's the scenario? Um, we've got a currency service, for example. Uh, the currency has a, a lookup uh, capability that we're trying to expose in some way. Uh, if you have a, a mobile client, maybe it's Android that wants to use this service. So I'm talking about developing a web-based app, for example. Uh, maybe it's an iPhone where I'd need to develop in C Sharp. Maybe it's a back-end process with Java, Python, Go, Rust, something like that. Uh, maybe it's a desktop tool uh, and it's running C Sharp or it's developed in C Sharp or Java. Uh, and maybe it's a website backend using Node.js. Right? All different languages but you want to expose that functionality to this lookup service consistently. 
So the problem is that there's multiple systems. Uh, the, you know, if, you, if you're taking this mobile device area, it's all bandwidth constrained uh, in terms of you know, working from a cellular site and getting the bandwidth all the way to the data center. Right? It's something that should be really efficient. Uh, you're talking about real-time data access, so maybe you're streaming in terms of you know, sending chunks of data rather than you know, large globs of data. Um, different languages and platforms. Uh, and the need to even version, right? If you're developing a centralized version of a service, you know, if you want to upgrade that service, then you're going to have to figure out a great versioning um, ability so that your uh, your consuming uh, languages are able to interpret things correctly. Uh, and backward compatibility. So these are all like a bunch of things to consider as you're building out the service and making it platform agnostic at the end of the day. So in comes kind of our first thing we'll talk about, which is RPC over HTTP JSON. Uh, this is a, a pretty good solution. It's simple, it's flexible, it's kind of universally accepted. The point here is when you have a RPC JSON interface, you're doing a lot of the work, right? You basically said, I've got two components, and I'm going to start with languages, and I have to build like soup to nuts, everything in that language to make these two things work, work uh, interoperate. Uh, and then if I want to build in safeguards, like type checking and stuff like that to make it more consistent and predictable, that's all on me to develop in every single language. Right? So in RPC over HPJSON, it's kind of a simple interface. Uh, you'll see it pretty consistently across a lot of different technologies, but it's got its downsides uh, in terms of being predictable, and it's got its downsides in terms of adoption in different languages and platforms. Um, I covered the data typing. Uh, I think a big thing to, to cover here as well is the efficiency. Uh, I'll give an example in a little bit, but you know, the idea that I'm going to take a language and I'm going to have it communicate over a text, uh, and then I'm going to have like serialization and deserialization of that text to try to fit it into object models after that, it's very inefficient. Like it takes a lot of CPU cycles to actually do that translation uh, and, and send stuff over task, text. So it's really inefficient when you start looking at the, the way it's transferring the data. Um, another important thing here is you know, we're, we're using HTTP as a transport, and it's not a perfect translation between a language and the HTTP protocol. So if I want to use errors, for example, you might think, hey, I can take my errors from my language and kind of encode them in the error response, but that's not really true because errors in, in uh, HTTP shouldn't include that type of a body. So you can't really use the HTTP like, protocol to encode like, language-specific information. It just doesn't work out. It doesn't translate in the, the right way. So there's lots of work to do, essentially, if you want to take advantage of something like HTTP and throw your own JSON messaging layer and, and accomplish RPC. Uh, so the next thing that people look at is, well, how about REST? Uh, so if I, if I say HTTP JSON and I say REST and they're completely two different things, do you guys, anybody disagree with that? Does that make sense or not? Let's say, okay. Uh, they are completely different. HTTP JSON is just simply a way of encoding information uh, and RPC is basically saying, I'm going to send these remote procedure calls over this transport, essentially. Uh, REST is actually uh, kind of builds on top of those fundamentals. Uh, REST actually leverages so something like HTTP JSON, but it's this idea that I can have a common way uh, for developers to communicate. Uh, the idea is like, I want to be able to have a language point at an endpoint, and if it's RESTful, then that language should be able to figure out how to do everything it needs to do with that interface. And so what that means is like, to be a truly RESTful interface, it needs to be self-discoverable. So it's kind of an interesting point. So what is self-discoverable in human terms? In human terms, it's basically the Google interface. right? For Google, that is our UI to a search engine. And I go to Google, and I enter in whatever I want to search, and I just know that that's how I get done what I want to get done. I've learned about it. All right, so that's the UI. And that is essentially self-discoverable. I've already figured it out. I know how to use it. In the case of computers, how do I get a computer right, or, or, or an application to point at some endpoint and know what to do already? Right? And that's the idea of REST, is there's a, a pattern that can be employed, which is the maze pattern. 
And the maze pattern basically says, take an application, point it at this endpoint, and when it gets there, it's gonna know how to discover exactly what it can do. It's gonna say, okay, here's an interface. It's gonna list a menu. You can go up, you can go down, you can go left, you can go right, you can go enter. And that's gonna define like, the ability to kind of traverse a hierarchy. So when you look at like, an, a REST object model, it's gonna include all kinds of different object types. Uh, it's gonna include all kinds of different actions you can do on these objects. And that whole model is gonna be self-discoverable. Right? So that's the big difference between, say, something that's HPJSON, like an RPC interface, where you define all that ahead of time in a language, and a REST interface, which is self-discoverable, meaning you point a language at a REST endpoint, and all of a sudden the language knows exactly what it can do. The latter, this whole REST interface, which is the nirvana, essentially, the holy grail of what we're really, what, what's really trying to be accomplished, make it simple to leverage any type of endpoint, uh, is very difficult. And people write books on this stuff. Right? There's conferences that are dedicated to building out truly RESTful services. Uh, I highly suggest them. If you're interested in actually pursuing a REST interface, there's good reasons to still do so. Uh, I highly suggest kind of researching and seeing what that's all about. If you've heard of something like Swagger or API-ery, right, these are all uh, kind of attempts at building frameworks around helping you build a REST interface. And then what that should end up doing is giving you these API bindings in your languages that you can actually make use of in your applications to, to solve the same problem that gRPC is trying to solve. So you've got HTTP JSON, you've got RPC over that, you've got these self-discoverable REST interfaces which are made easier by way of something like Swagger, right? And then you've got something like gRPC that, that we're gonna talk about. So, I mean, if you look at this thread online, uh, there's a guy, Simon Brown, that I met this last weekend at Software Circus in Europe. Uh, he, t he consults with customers about software architecture. And what he said down here is, I've heard advice uh, such as break up your monolith into microservices uh, with REST APIs between them a number of time this, times this week. And then at the top, he says, I've met a number of organizations who have done just this, and they're now struggling for obvious reasons. It's basically a, a bad idea. Right? If you're gonna take an application and you're gonna split it up into microservices, and then you're gonna have to take the time to define a REST API between every single service, that's a lot of time and effort, and you're probably not gonna get the value out of that that you need to. So there's gotta be a, a better way of getting these things to communicate. So here's a, the, kind of the summary slide of what I've been talking about in terms of setting up gRPC. Uh, on the left side, you've got some of these attempts at building uh, or making it easier to build these interfaces. Who all's used SOAP before? Yeah, what do you think about it? <laughs> for, the, for the record, there's a lot of thumbs down. <laughs> uh, I would say inefficient, like if you have a large service, by the time like the WSDL file is essentially this interface definition, uh, by the time this WSDL file gets consumed by a language, I mean, the, the memory footprint is just insane sometimes. So I'd say largely inefficient. Uh, I talked about the serialization. Uh, XML, although very advanced in terms of the data structures you can encode inside of XML, uh, very heavy on the CPU, right? So very inefficient from a transport perspective. Uh, so SOAP is one that's been around for a long time. Uh, another interesting point about it is that it's idiomatic in terms of client server. So SOAP, uh, there's frameworks that have been written for different languages, whether that's Go or Python or anything else and it should help you actually create these language bindings that are SOAP enabled. Um, so the idiomatic wise, like SOAP does have stuff that's out there, but the problem is that it's not part of the SOAP project, it's maintained independently by a bunch of people who care about those languages. So there are frameworks that help you create idiomatic connectivity. Is SOAP curl friendly? Uh, can you just pop open a, uh, you know, a, a bash session and just go open a SOAP interface? Not really, right? So it's a little bit more difficult to troubleshoot. Um, yeah, so inefficient, I'd say no. Predictable, somewhat because you've got your bindings in your languages on a client-server basis, and that does provide some predictability. You didn't build that all yourself. There's some data type validation to it. So the next one down here is RPC over JSON, uh, which is basically where you said, I'm gonna create my own interface, but with a minimal amount of work. Uh, at that point, you don't have a client-server stubs or client-server bindings to take advantage of. You gotta write it all from scratch, 
So lots of work just to make every language compatible if that's what you need to do. Uh, it is curl friendly, right? So if you want to troubleshoot it and you want to do testing on it by way of pulling up curl, then that's available. So that's kind of cool. Uh, the frameworks are all custom to help take advantage of it. Uh, there's uh, serialization is whatever you want it to be, JSON, something like that. Uh, it's probably not efficient and definitely not predictable. Uh, custom REST, the difference with the custom REST is that you probably took the time to build your own framework. So rather than le leveraging Swagger or something like that, you said, hey, I, Swagger doesn't do exactly what I need. It doesn't fit my use case. I'm gonna actually build Swagger from scratch. Like, we've done that and it's not too fun, right? But it does get you to be a little bit more predictable. Uh, so that's what custom REST is all about. Uh, it's not efficient and it's probably not predictable. Under REST, that's where we cover Swagger. Uh, you do get your idiomatic client server stubs. Uh, it is curl friendly at times, um, but it's not efficient, uh, not predictable. Uh, the very bottom one is where we get to gRPC. So why is gRPC so cool? Well, the, the stubs, the bindings that you use for gRPC are all generated by way of the gRPC project. Uh, so as the gRPC standard for protobuf, et cetera, is maintained and move forward, then your bindings at the language level are actually all uh, put out as well. So they're all in sync. Uh, gRPC is not curl friendly. That's kind of an important point. Like, but they have their own tools for troubleshooting. Um, but is that really important? Like if you're developing your application and I said, hey, the trade-off is that you're either curl friendly or you're super efficient, what's more important, right? It's probably that you're super efficient, right? Because the bandwidth, data center bandwidth, CPU usage, et cetera, I think that that probably trumps you know, the, the curl-friendly side of uh, what you get by using other types of uh, uh, methods. Uh, the framework's included for developing your, your stubs. Uh, serialization is binary. Right? So super efficient, uh, and it's predictable because everything is generated for you. So let's go in and let's, uh, let's take, I guess, one more point here. Um, so the Linux philosophy ap applied. So in Linux, the idea with, with all the different tools that are encompassed in the distributions is that you want to write focus tools, and you want them to do their job, do them well, but you also want them to interoperate with other things. So in Linux, if you have different tools working together, how do they communicate? The Linux pipe. Right? Uh, so what we're really looking to do is create a, essentially a Linux pipe for boring uh, distributed components, and that is gRPC. So gRPC is a universal open source RPC framework designed to create efficient and uh, fast polyglot services. So polyglot meaning many languages, any language, uh, with a usage ranging from data center scale, so running backend services in the data center, uh, to uh, bandwidth constrained devices like my uh, iPhone traveling between all kinds of different parts of the world. Right? So that is the focus behind gRPC. Be efficient uh, and be fast. So gRPC is based on uh, proto buff protocol buffers, uh, which are really how we can serialize da uh, structured data. So if I have a, an object in a certain language, uh, the protobufs help me take that object serialize it into a protobuf object, essentially, and then on the other end, it comes out as a language-specific object. All right, so the protobufs help me with that translation, and they help me define a kind of a middle ground. So it's based on what we call an IDL, which is the interface definition language, uh, which is where we can define, like, how do two things communicate with each other? This IDL, essentially, is what creates the client stubs and the server stubs, and that's where you really focus all your time when you're defining your interfaces. So it's got a simple IDL, uh, uses HP2 out of the gate. So HP2 is super efficient in terms of reusing uh, HTTP connections. So it's great for, for mobile devices and just being efficient with data center resources. Um, it's got bi-directional uh, support and streaming. So if you want to have a client or a, a server send data to a phone, if I've got a gigabyte in traffic, uh, you can actually stream that in chunks. Right, so that the client is able to have a great user experience with that and, and uh, chunk through the data as it comes in versus one whole segment of data. And there's other things. So it's not only like the user experience, but that has to do with the memory. Right? If I have to chunk a gig of memory, I need a chunk of uh, a gig of RAM. Right? But if I can actually do that in bits and pieces and I can stream it to the device, then the requirements to make sense of that data are much, much smaller. Uh, the other thing here is that it's got extensible middleware. Um, so if you're de de developing your interface, 
there may be stuff that gRPC doesn't have already. Uh, maybe you want to add some um, uh, throttling. Maybe you want to add some authentication. Uh, all kinds of different stuff like that that, is, that you can essentially inject in the gRPC uh, work stream, and it can intercept requests and do extra things on the request for you. So plenty of extensibility capabilities is what it comes down to. So what languages are there today? Uh, all of these languages, right? So a lot of the common languages that we, you would use for not only your front-end development for mobile devices, but also your back-end development uh, in the data center. Uh, how about some performance examples? We're looking here at a dashboard that shows the comparison of languages. So if you just take uh, a IDL, a protobuf IDL, you define it, and you generate your client server stubs, and you take a look at what the round trip time is for, for the language itself. On the bottom, you have your baseline, which is your net perf. So what is the, uh, you know, what is the lowest expected performance? And then the delta between the net perf and any of the other colors is that language's you know, added overhead for actually having the two processes communicate. So in this case, you've got C++, which is, I don't know, 25 extra uh, or nanoseconds. And then you've got Go, C Sharp, Java. So super efficient from that perspective. Here's some more practical results. Like when I was talking about XML, JSON as compared to gRPC, uh, XML and JSON are text-based. Uh, gRPC is binary based, uh, so the translation there is much, much less uh, uh, in terms of getting stuff from one language to the other. So here's an example at the very top. You've got the JSON RPC interface. Uh, the total time for the transaction was um, uh, eight, uh, eight minutes and seven seconds, thank you. And then you had gRPC, the total time was uh, 36 seconds. So that's a pretty significant difference, right? Uh, if you actually take gRPC and you scale it out to many, many hosts or many requests, uh, then the difference is even more substantial for accomplishing the aggregate task, right? Because with gRPC, you can stream or you can uh, send it out in different ways. So you get down to seven seconds at that point. Um, if you compare the amount of memory consumed, uh, so for the, uh, so the, the nanoseconds per operation was down by 100%. The allocations per operation was down by 23%, and then the memory actually consumed through the operations was down about, by about 40%. So huge difference. Like Going with this human-readable text format to make two components communicate together is probably a bad idea from an efficiency perspective. Uh, using something with a binary format that, J that gRPC helps you do is a, a good idea to keep things very, very efficient. Cool. Uh, how does this apply to something more practical? So don't take this as gospel, but just give you an example. Uh, Kubernetes, like when you look at a cluster and you look at the CPU usage, this is what's been said. Uh, out of a Kubernetes cluster, uh, because you know, it doesn't use gRPC internally for everything right now, uh, some of it's based on Swagger and other uh, API stuff, um, but you've got about 47% of the CPU usage is what's been said. Uh, I've heard this repeated a couple times, but I'd love to get more firm details. But 47% is based on translating text uh, to have different things communicate with each other in a Kubernetes cluster. So pretty cool example of why uh, we probably don't want to do that. So gRP ser service and Go. So let's get practical. Uh, there is a, uh, so Vlad put together some great examples for you uh, down here at this URL, and this is, session's obviously going to be available after the conference uh, through video and as a, a PowerPoint, but that is a, a GitHub repo that gives you some examples of how to use some of the gRPC features that we're going to walk through. But what we're going to do is something pretty simple. We're going to find this service contract, which is this IDL, this interface definition. Uh, Excuse me, we're going to compile the IDL into service interfaces uh, and essentially a uh, source code. And then we're going to actually implement the, the methods that were defined to create a real working service. Uh, so, first of all, let's look at the IDL. So, here we have a protobuf file. Uh, at the very top, uh, you can see that we're defining the, the version of protobuf that we'll be leveraging. Next up, you can see the different messages. And we've got three that we're defining here. One is an object, which is the currency with uh, a few fields in it, the code, the name, number. Uh, we're using strings and in int32s there. Uh, and then we've got a currency list, which is essentially an array of the currency items. 
And then we've got the currency request, where we're receiving uh, the ability to have a code and a number. Um, this service that we're creating is about being able to look up currency. So there's a database of currency, the US dollar may be index one, you know, the euro is index two, right? And we want to be able to like query that currency database. That's what we're kind of generating here. So that's the interface. There's the request. At the very bottom here, we've actually got uh, the currency service. So this is, a, this is where we declare what the remote methods are that the client's going to be able to access. So in this case, we've got the get currency list uh, method. And inside of it, it's unary. So we've got a request object. And then we've got a list being returned from that method. So pretty simple. Right? That's your protobuf definition. That is this like, middle ground that allows you to define the contract between two components. So let's compile that. So we've got our protobuf file. Uh, we'll use proto-c to actually compile that into a, uh, a generated code. So this is generated code that you don't change. Right? This comes out of that uh, IDL. Uh, so in this, you can see kind of the one-to-one -one mapping of the message going into the type currency. On the right side, it's obviously Go, right? But if you use Proto-C from a different language, it would generate the code in whatever language that you're going to be using. So in Go's perspective, you've got the fields mapping pretty closely to the types. Uh, you've got the array, uh, the currency list array going into an array, the parameter of items with an uh, array of currencies or currency pointers. And then you've got the currency request mapping over. And then here you have an uh, in interface, which is unary, that includes the, the context object. So this is essentially working generated code. And the next step is just implementing what I see on the right. So let's implement it. So here's the simple implementation. Uh, we're going to define a currency service struct. And that's going to be an array of pointers, which are from the currency object that just came in on the last slide, right? With this new Go object that got generated for us. Uh, our, uh, our function is going to be the get currency list function. And what we're going to do here, uh, this is on the server side, is we're going to range a, uh, a CSV. So you can see under the for statement uh, right here, we're going to range through a c.data, which is a CSV file. Uh, if the request that comes in that specifies the number and the code, I'm going to append that item to the list, and then I'm going to return this item down at the bottom as a currency list. So this is the server side implementing this uh, get currency list uh, function. So here we have uh, what this actually looks like as a runnable program. First of all, you can see the data come in from a CSV file at the very top line. Uh, then you can see that we're starting our listener. Uh, then we're going to create our new currency service with this data uh, object. Uh, we'll create our gRPC server at that point. We're going to register that server and the gRPC server and the currency service together in the protobuf. Uh, and then we're going to serve down at the bottom. All right, so we've, we've taken generated code. We've created a pretty simple uh, function, which is this get currency list. Then we package it, packaged it up as a runnable program in Go uh, so that we can actually uh, serve up this gRPC endpoint. So when I call it from the client, this is what it looks like. Uh, we've got a runnable program again as a client. At the very top, you've got a dial statement that says, what's my endpoint that's hosting this gRPC service? Uh, you're going to create a client by passing the connection in. And then you're going to pass the client to the print USD function. So the client gets passed in, and then here it starts. So we're going to, as a client, we're executing that remote get currency list function. Uh, we're going to come down as we get the results, and we'll range through the results, all the items, and we'll spit out the information uh, that comes back. So pretty simple. We had the server side implemented. This is the client side that's using the client stubs, uh, and he's making use of the data ranging through it and sp spitting out the results. Pretty cool, pretty basic. Uh, I should have used that for you guys, but it's all right. <laughs> all right, so uh, any questions there? Does that make sense? Generate the bindings, use the, create the server, create the client, and all of a sudden the two things are talking to each other. No, no REST model generated, 
no working at an HTTP level, right? Lots of uh, predictability because there's type safe like built into this. Uh, so there's a lot, of, lot less guesswork. You've got a really efficient way to make two things communicate together. So let's get a little bit more complicated with it to show some of the features of gRPC. So streaming, uh, what the heck is this? Um, I mentioned it earlier. If I am, say, a, a device like this, and I'm going to receive a data set, uh, and this data set is bigger, I probably want to stream the data set to the device, because then the device can decide how much it's going to chunk by. So if it's a gigabyte data set, the device can pull off a megabyte, look at it, you know, show it up on the device, uh, and then it can move on and get the next megabyte, allowing the user to see the data in real time versus having to chunk through the gigabyte uh, to show the results to the user. So streaming is, is pretty important from many perspectives, uh, uh, but it's, it's great for the user experience, especially on the mobile side. Um, so what does this look like? So if I update my IDL to include streaming, uh, this is what it's going to look like. At the very top, you have the existing uh, definition of get currency list. Uh, and that's, that's a non-streaming example unchanged here. As we step down, we've got three different streams, essentially. We've got three different stream types. One is server streaming, and that's the example that I was referring to where I've got a client device, and it's chunking, essentially, the, the results that come in, or the server is chunking it for me. Uh, then I've got client streaming. So the opposite is true of what I defined from the server. So in some cases, you want the server to send in chunks. Uh, in other cases, you want the client to send in chunks. Maybe the client is uh, on Periscope, right, and you're recording stuff, and you want to send like chunks at a time upward. You want the server to be ready to receive in that same way that uh, it would be uh, sending. So you can see that the reverse is just uh, the stream is just reversed in that case to have a stream be submitted rather than received. Uh, there's also bidirectional streaming. So maybe you want the communication both ways to be streamed. Who knows? So all all three are possible. Uh, here's an example of actually putting that uh, into effect. So if I'm on the, uh, it's a server stream example. If I am on the server side uh, affecting this get currency stream uh, method, then this is what I'm adding. So as the results come in, uh, instead of appending to an array, I'm just going to send, I'm going to open up that stream that came into me, and I'm going to send that result real time back to the client. All right, so instead of the server just appending in, in memory and creating the, the data set and then sending that as a whole, it's going to send the, the results every time it gets one as it iterates through the array. Uh, on the client side, what does this look like? How is it different? Uh, on the client side, uh, we're going to uh, activate the get currency stream uh, method. And then as we iterate through, uh, we get to this for section, you're going to see that we have a, uh, a stream receive. right? And then uh, we're going to be printing out results as there's items that come into that stream. So that for, that for loop gets, uh, keeps on going. Essentially, it's, I think it's a blocking channel, I would assume. And once an item comes in the channel, uh, then it moves on and actually processes it. Cool. Uh, questions there? Good? Cool. Uh, next one. So how do I secure a gRPC interface? Another example of like if you wanted to roll this yourself, uh, getting TLS support across you know any language across different frameworks is difficult. Yep. Question. Yep. Uh, so this example is not bidirectional, right? This would be the um, the client. Well, this is a server uh, side, and. I actually don't know your answer, the answer to that because I haven't implemented the bidirectional. So I can always, uh, we can follow up afterwards and get you in touch with one of the gRPC people. Yeah. OK. So another feature, TLS. Uh, how do you guys usually do TLS as you create your own you know, way of getting things to communicate? Not very easily, not very standardly. Uh, this is going to be really easy. So TLS setup for uh, gRPC is this. Uh, if you've got cer certificate files, key files, then you use the credentials new server TLS from file function there, or method. Uh, and then when you create your gRPC server, then you pass in uh, the gRPC creds object, essentially. And that is how you create the server side uh, where it's SSL-based at that point. If I'm on the client, 
it's just as simple, essentially. You use the same exact uh, method for creating this uh, TLS certs object, and then you inject it right here with a with transport credentials method, uh, which will return that, that credential object uh, for the dial. So pretty easy. How about request timeouts? How do you usually deal with backups and requests and all that stuff? Uh, well, this is easy here. Uh, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna use Go's context object. Uh, the context object is where you can pass around arbitrary data, uh, and it's thread safe, essentially. So you can send the context object to a method, uh, and then uh, you know, as it gets executed in a thread, it's able to use the information on that context and make use of it. So in this case, we're gonna uh, augment the print USD function uh, and then we're going to add in the context at the very top. So at the top line here, we've got context with timeout, uh, and we're gonna specify the new context, and then we're gonna say the timeout is essentially 200 milliseconds. And now I've got a context object that's got this 200 millisecond timeout information in it, uh, and then to make use of it, I go down to the very next line down here, and I say, get the currency list, pass the context, but that context has the timeout. And so now, if, there is, uh, if the 200 milliseconds has exceeded, then gRPC is gonna error uh, and say it didn't complete within the deadline. So timeouts are easy. Cool. How about error handling? <laughs> I think when you look at the, like error handling is probably one of the, the most inconsistent things as you look at how interfaces actually work together. <laughs> Um, if you look at, like, I, I guess in my opinion, if you want two things to work very predictably, then what happens during errors is one of the most important things, right? If I've got an error and the, the client side doesn't know how to recover, or doesn't know what to do, what steps to take, right, then things can get out of sync and all kinds of problems happen. So having well-defined errors is pretty important, and it, it gets, it's actually very easy as you use gRPC to do that. So an anti-pattern within gRPC is to, def is to send a error back, which hasn't been decorated at all, right? Sending back the exact error is probably the, not the thing you wanna do. Uh, you actually wanna do some wrapping on it. So what does that look like? So in the case of a, uh, a server error, uh, if I've got an, you know, some type of a invalid input or something like that, I wanna return a, a new error uh, that's got a enum or a invalid, a codes.invalid argument. So it should have some type of a code established for that type of error that occurred. Uh, and that should be actually defined within my protobuf, essentially, so that it translates back and forth easily. Uh, and that error should actually indicate some extra information uh, so that you can make sense of you know, what's going on as the client tries to report back uh, what the problem was. Uh, on the client side, if that server is actually declaring the error, which it should, and it's decorating it a bit, then it should be able to interpret it in different ways. So as you know, we've got this error that happened, and I can switch through it and figure out what the error is, then the client should actually uh, go through and print a special message for that error. So it's all easy and very possible as you use gRPC to do this in a very standard way. Uh, and you can even get more complex. So if I decided that I wanted to add more information to the error that gets generated, I'm able to do that, and then at the very bottom, I can essentially take that object that got uh, generated, and I can send back a, uh, an error-based uh, object through the interface. So, uh, and then on the other side, as I you know, have a more complex error that gets generated by the server, then I can make use of that error uh, on the client, and I can, you know, in this case, what I'm doing if I started with an object uh, which may have generated the error, the reason for the error, uh, I can actually cast that object, or I can assert it as the PB currency object, and if, it's, you know, if it doesn't assert correctly, then I can actually spit that out at the client, and I can show the client, like, hey, here's the object that, object that came through, uh, take a look for yourself, and you tell me if there's something in here that was invalid that may have caused me to have a problem. So all kinds of capabilities you can, you can have by one, uh, making sure you're using the gRPC errors, uh, uh, defining them in your protobuf, uh, but also doing uh, more details and asserting the values so you can properly report like, back to the client like what was going on on the server side and why there was an error. Other features. So other really cool stuff with gRPC. Uh, we talked about uh, interceptors and taps a little bit. 
So uh, in the case of services, like you may want to establish a tap that does some type of flow control. Uh, so if you want to make sure that you know, you're not overriding a service or doing DOS attacks, you could, you could actually inject you know, some types of middleware uh, that ensure you can establish some flow control. Uh, if you had extra things you wanted to add for authorization, uh, you could do that. So there's all kinds of extra goodies that you can inject inside of the, uh, the gRPC workflow uh, to add some extra value on top. Uh, there's tracing for more information about the transactions, um, support for pluggable authorization, uh, and the ability to limit message sizes. So, so gRPC, like, I love it. We're big fans as a team. Uh, we just worked on one of our first implementations with it as part of the CSI project. Have you guys heard of CSI before? Uh, or just interfaces in general, CNI, CRI, uh, uh, CSI, there's like three big ones right now. Uh, anyways. As you know, the like cloud native ecosystems evolving. As um, you know, all these different components in these cloud native ecosystems are looking to talk talk to, talk with one another. Then the interfaces and how they communicate are becoming much more important. Uh, so one of the things that we're we're excited about is you know what uh, gRPC is bringing to the table, and it is being used across these different interfaces. Uh, so as container orchestrators like Kubernetes are expanding out uh, to be able to talk to you know, different components and, and do more than they are today, uh, gRPC is what's being used. So in um, one of the projects we've been working on very closely is the CSI project, the Container Storage Interface Project. And that's how a container orchestrator talks to storage platform. Uh, the, the CSI interface, or the gRPC interface is used there. And so we had our first implementation with it recently. And I can say it actually went really well. Uh, so a lot of the challenges that the team had been looking at previously in terms of creating our custom, like our own REST interface, uh, working in the HTTP JSON area, uh, those were all like problems arose, which shaped some of what you guys see in this presentation today. And a lot of that stuff went away as we embraced uh, gRPC and worked very closely in the CSI project. So we are. Uh, we're very excited about it, uh, and I think it's a, a great way for, a great thing for you guys to look at as you figure out like, you know, how to get your components to, to really talk to each other in the data center. So with that, that's, that's pretty much all I had for you guys. Any, uh, any questions? Yep. Uh, I'm actually not sure the answer to that, so. Let me, uh, you can talk to me after and we'll get you hooked up with someone who can give you all the details that you want there. Uh, I would encourage you, though, to pick up uh, gRPC.io. Just bring up the website and they've got some great documentation that goes over all the details of what gRPC does and uh, some of the stuff that they're working on. Cool. Any other questions? All right, with that, thank you guys very much and enjoy the rest of the conference.